Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us on iTunes right now, go ahead and leave us a five-star review, won't you please? Here is a really great review from Bats. 01K says Chrissy Rocks. <laughs> I swear to God, I don't write these guys. Chrissy Rocks, you are awesome. You're everything comedy needs right now. Oh, well, thanks. Well, thank you so much, Bats. Uh, quick shout out to our sponsor, Cushy Dreams. They are my go to for CBD products. Cushy Dreams specializes in really high quality smokable CBD. Uh, in tins, aka bud, or these pre-rolled joints. I really love their stuff. They come in these different indica sativa blends like relax, dream, energy, hustle, really whatever you want to do with your day. Cushy Dreams has a strain for you. Uh, and I was always somebody who was like kind of sensitive to weed. Like you want to relax, but like I would go out to lunch. Like I would be kind of useless for the rest of the night. And what I love about Cushy Dreams is like I just have a couple pulls. I'm a joint girl. <laughs> I know that sounds weird. Uh, I like to just like have a couple pulls, then I feel relaxed, but also kind of focused and I can get done what I want to do with my day. It's not, if you're like a person who's sensitive to, um, to weed, this is, this is so great for you. Um, I think there's like 0.3, 0 0.03%, uh, very, very small amount of THC in here. Uh, it's everything is grown in a small batch to to keep uh, like purity and, and retain flavor and cannabinoids. It's grown here in the USA, which is probably the best part about it. You can go to their website, cushydreams.com right now and check out their lab results. They are really big on doing tests to ensure compliance and purity uh, and all that good stuff. Uh, join the men and women who are sick of their vapes and their gummies and want to smoke their CBD. So go to cushydreams.com and use that promo code CMP to get 20% off every order. And I also think uh, free shipping. Really quick, guys, I'm doing stand up in a town near you. The domestic terrorist tour continues. Uh, I'm going to be at Stand Up New York in New York City, April 9th. That's with comedians at the compound. Uh, then heading to the House of Laughs in Wilmington, Delaware, sometime in late April. I think those dates are being switched around. April 30th, Boca Black Box in Boca Raton, Florida. May 1st, Lake Park Black Box in Palm Beach, Florida. May 2nd, Side Splitters in Tampa, Florida. May 9th, Bricktown in Oklahoma City. May 14th and 15th, Communes of the Compound will be at the Big Laugh Comedy Club in Austin. May 18th, uh, I'll be at Zany's in Nashville. May 19th, Stand Up Live in Huntsville, Alabama. June 3rd, Hilarities in in Cleveland and June 4th and 5th Skyline Comedy Club in Appleton, Wisconsin. Some of these dates are by myself. Some of these dates are with uh, my good friend, Tim Young, and a couple are with comedians of the compound. Uh, so all funny guys, all funny shows. Uh, another quick shout out to our other sponsor, Lucy.co. All my sponsors are all about like uh, things to put in your mouth. I don't know what's going on this month, but I like it. Uh, it's 2021. It's time to get rid of your cigarettes uh, and absolutely your dip. Oh, if you guys are using dip at this point, blech, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, what I love about these products is that uh, they, they were founded, this whole company, Lucy, was founded by Caltech scientists and actually former smokers that were looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. They were like, we want tobacco alternatives that don't suck. The, uh, these products were researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. Uh, this, this nicotine gum has four milligrams of nicotine that comes in wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. They also have a cherry ice lozenge with four milligrams of nicotine and each and every flavor tastes great. Uh, these products are convenient, discreet, have them at the gym, on a flight, on the go, in your car, wherever. Ditch your cigarettes, boys and girls, unplug your vape, throw out your dip, and get you some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each and every month. It's so simple. You don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. And for all my CMP listeners, go to lucy.co, L-U-C-Y dot C-O, and use promo code CMP to get 20% off all products at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer uh, warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco, and nicotine is an addictive chemical. You know, also has addictive savings. Woo! I'm so corny. Go to lucy.co and use promo code CMP. 
and throw out those icky cigarettes. Okay. I'm so excited to have this gal on the pod today. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of the most, she has, I think, the most interesting combination of talents and, and, um, and likes here. She's not only a conservative, a libertarian, a conservatarian, if you will. Um, she's also quite a bit of an acti activist and also a wrestler. Never had anybody that wrestles on this podcast before, so I'm very excited to talk to her about that. It's Miss Olivia Rondeau. Hello, girl. Hi. Oh, my God. What a <laughs> great intro. I love that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, you are so welcome. How did you, how and when did you get into wrestling? Um... I started wrestling mainly to spite my dad because he was one of those people that is like, all my kids are going to play a sport every single season. And so in the fall, I always played volleyball. In the winter, I always played basketball. But when I got to high school, I really, really, really did not like the basketball coach. I did not like the basketball team. And I so I literally was like, out of spite, I'm just going to do the only other winter sport option, which is wrestling, the boys wrestling team. Um, so I take the paperwork home. My dad's like, uh, did they even allow girls on the team? Is there a girls team? I was like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> there, there definitely was not a girls team. There still isn't a girls team at that high school. But um, I definitely learned a lot. My first year, I did it my freshman year. So my first year was definitely rough because they just like throw you in there. I think um, I think the, just being a female makes people want to go like 10 times harder on you because nobody wants to get beat by the girl. Right. So it definitely was rough my first year, but then I started winning competitions and doing a lot of off season practices and just kind of worked my way up. And so my junior year of high school, I actually made the Olympic development team. So I had to move to boarding school. Oh um, and now I'm a collegiate wrestler, but unfortunately my season has been ruined because of COVID. So they sent everybody home. We're all doing online classes. Um, I haven't even gotten to, you know, go to college nationals or any of the cool things I really wanted to do this year. But mm -hmm. fortunately, I kept my eligibility because of some NCAA rule. I don't really understand how it works, but I'll hopefully be back on the mat this fall. So you actually haven't competed at all in college yet? Correct. Or was this your Everything first year? Everything is ruined. Yeah. Everything is ruined. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, it's so interesting to hear you talk about, like you were, you kind of th were thrust into uh, basically an all male sport. Like that's pretty wild. Cause this was, um, and I imagine, so you're talking about early aughts here. Like how long ago were you in high school um, on the wrestling team? I'm 20 and I started when I was 14. So it was 2015 when I first started. And was there any like pushback from like the other guys or the coaches being like, oh, there's a girl on the team? Was there any My, weirdness? I had the best. I honestly had the best high school coaches ever. Um, they really tried their best to treat me as just any other guy on the team. And I was not the first girl they've ever had on the team. So most of the coaches back then actually did have experience coaching like one or two females before. Um, there definitely was some issues with and not necessarily kids on my own team, but when we would go to an away match in another school, the ref their referees, their coaches, their wrestlers had a problem with it because we were one of the you know very few schools in the county that had one or two girls in the wrestling team. So it's definitely it was definitely like a topic of discussion. It was definitely a controversy at the time. But I will give my school a lot of credit because they really, there was, um, I know of a lot of other females who wrestle in this area who were not received by their schools, were kicked off the team, were not allowed to try out. So um, I definitely got lucky with the people I was put with, but that's not to say I didn't face any sexism. I mean, the, the one time that rings out in my head the most was we were having a try meet. So three schools come together. Um, and the referee typically brings all the teams together to go over the rules before the, before the match starts. Um, and I'm the only girl there who looks right at me at, at, in a crowd of like 60 guys of the, you know, the three combined teams and is like, and this is a man's sport. I don't want to see you crying when you lose. This wow. Is like, he was and like, this literally, this is a boy's ago. sport. Yeah, this was my freshman year. So this was, this was about five years ago. Um, and it really was like insane to me that he even singled me out, that he looked me in the eye in front of like all these dudes, my first year wrestling and like literally tried to discourage me and try to shame me. Like, 
I don't know. I feel like if if I was that referee and I saw a female wrestler, I'd want to encourage her and make and be like, hey, it's okay. It's okay to lose, you know, come back next time. And this was before we even wrestled. Like he had no idea what my capabilities were or if I was a crybaby or anything like that. So he ended up losing his job. So that was uh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> was he older? I'm imagining like a super, uh, the kind of gu guy that would react that way. Either like they have a daughter and they think like women are too precious to be in wrestling or like in that kind of a sport. Or he just has never in his life, you know, conceived uh, that a girl could be a wrestler. I don't know. Yeah, he was, he was definitely a boomer. Like he was <laughs> like. He was, it was just weird because the way he said it was like so evil. Like, this is a man's sport. Don't cry when you lose. Like, oh my God. You should have been what like, I, I have a dick, you? you know? <laughs> right. Like, what did I do to you, sir? I'm like, I'm 14 years old. What did I do? Wow. Good for you. And like, I, re I remember I was a gymnast. Like, that was the path that I took. And then like my, uh, when, I, when I was nine, I started gymnastics, which is what you might as well be 30. Because it's like, unless oh, you're starting gymnastics. God out the womb like it, you're just you, your beat your boobs are gonna grow in they're gonna beat you to it um it's just well, gonna you know people that started gymnastics out the womb until i was about nine years old and realized i was already larger than every gymnast oh, like wow. i had my growth spurt super early i'm a heavyweight woman's wrestler like there's no way i can do the shit i used to do <laughs> when i did gymnastics but um i commend everyone who does it because i can't do that shit <laughs> Yeah. And I, I remember I loved gymnastics, but I like I found like my ankles were getting weak and they would crack all the time. And I'd be like walking through the halls at like high in high school. And I would just like kind of fall like I had such a weird oh, trick wow. ankle. And I was like, all right. So I kind of transitioned. And at the time I was still doing like springboard diving. But then I transitioned to just like fully just to just did diving. And uh, there's you kind of don't really understand um, unless you're somebody who does a sport like pretty competitively for a number of years like the what that gives you like i i think of of all the things i've i did as a kid or even like a young adult like that gave me the most like structure and fortitude and like uh really taught me how to like discipline and like kind of did teach me like not to be a wuss and to to keep going and um did you did you find that you like learned those kind of things or was it more like you're constantly confronting this like boy girl conflict i guess i definitely i learned a lot of positive things from wrestling and then at you know after my first year it was like the only people that like kind of felt weird about me being the only girl was somebody else i like i can i can walk into any wrestling man any wrestling practice anywhere and feel comfortable i don't care if i don't know anybody i don't care if i'm only female there it was usually like other people having an issue with it and then i feel like the best way to gain respect is to just be confident and to be a decent wrestler because i've found i've changed a lot of people's minds who even like adult male coaches who did not think that women can wrestle on a boys team or women can be successful in wrestling i proved them wrong not by being like combative and calling people sexist but just by literally just physically being proving good. Them wrong. um yeah. so i definitely learned a lot of confidence um right now i feel like even my even since i haven't been wrestling because of covid my mental health has even taken like a, a dip because wrestling was like it's a it's one of my main coping mechanisms it's like an outlet if you're ever angry stressed anxious depressed upset it's just a great way to work out your feelings and also just the confidence that you know you carry yourself a different way when you're when any combat's poor i think um but yeah there, there's a ton of benefits to it and ultimately if you don't let the sexist comments get to you i think you can really anyone can really succeed in it did you ever have a moment where you like grabbed a guy's dick max <laughs> no <laughs> i've had i've had guys That'd be the first um, thing I would feel, do, by the way. I'd be like, hi. <laughs> I've had guys be like, is like feel uncomfortable at first, like, oh my God, like they feel like they're gonna touch me in an inappropriate way. But I've really never it's really weird because I don't really think about it because a lot of people ask, like, oh, aren't the guys just gonna get like, you know, a boner or something when they wrestle you? Or aren't the guys yeah. just loving to wrestle you? I'm like, not really, because like I said, no one wants to lose to a girl in front of all their, you know, their school, their cheerleaders, their family and stuff, because so usually when I'm out there, they're literally trying to beat your ass. Like they'll go harder on me than they Focusing will on the guy. so hard. They're just like, don't lose, don't lose, don't lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
that's awesome. What do you think? So it's interesting now. Like, what do you think about the whole um, people are making a big fuss over like the trans women being in women's sports debate um, as somebody who regularly competed and, you know, competes against guys. Do you, what are your, what are your feelings on all of that? For me personally, it was never an issue because people, people obviously ask me that question all the time. Like, how would you hmm. feel if you had to compete against a biological male? I'm like, I, I did like that I for years. I did yeah. that for years in college. They do have separate divisions, but in my practice, I'm literally like, my coach will tell you, like, just the other females on my team, they're usually just not in my weight class or I'm just, like, I'm easily able to overpower them. So I end up practicing with the guys nine out of ten times. So it's, like, even still, I don't compete against guys. I know how a male body works. I know, like, the strength difference and all that stuff. So for me, it was never personally an issue. But I also understand, like, I'm an outlier. Most women do not want to wrestle a biological male. I think nine out of ten women would be, like, I would wrestle if there was a female wrestling team. You know what I mean? So I feel like it's very important to provide opportunities to women and girls who just, I, it's just really not fair. It's like, you will never hear about a, bas a woman basketball player who is forced to play on a male basketball team or a soccer player who's forced to play on a male, ba or a male soccer team. Um, it's just like the world of wrestling isn't as advanced to allow for female opportunities yet, but it is changing. We just recently, I think we have one or two schools that have D one women's wrestling now, but it's, it's very, very small. So um, I was, I am against biological males in women's divisions, but as of now, it's like, there's barely enough interest to even make female only teams in a lot of States, you know? And I would say even less uh, people that would be able to make like a trans only league. Like I'll hear people saying that right. trans people should be in their right. own league. There's I'm like, most people, enough. most people have, enough maybe met one trans person in their life you know um I, I, maybe the media makes it sound like i know uh, one i know there's... one transgender wrestler that's i know one transgender wrestler um he, he was actually like pretty much very famous in the media a couple of years ago because there was a huge controversy he's a female to male wrestler who was in texas and because of the laws there if you're you know female biologically like you know have female parts you have to wrestle in the female division but he had already transitioned like he had gotten surgery and um testosterone and all that kind of stuff so he didn't want to wrestle with the females and so now i actually before i signed to the school i'm at now a few years ago i signed then he came into another school where he actually wrestles and we were about to be teammates but he actually went there to wrestle on the men's team so the only the even the only case of a transgender wrestler i know is somebody who is female to male and wants to wrestle males. So I feel like it's very, very rare. I like, it's just not common for a man to tr transition to a female to join wrestling. I've never heard of it, but there are cases in other sports. I mean, I had, I did this whole video with the daily caller last year and now like I, it, it's crazy because it blew up again recently. Now it has a million views. At the time, it had like eight thousand views last year. Wow! But it's so funny how that's how it was like so stuff weird. Matches. I literally did it over a year ago. Then suddenly, I have like five hundred new Instagram followers. I was like, "Who is talking shit?" Because I need to find <laughs> out who tagged me and some shit. But I yeah. went to YouTube and it was literally that video. But I went across. There was like four or five different examples of like MMA fighters, powerlifters, uh, handball players who were male to female transgender and were like completely dominating the league. So it does happen. I just haven't seen it happen in wrestling. Do you have moments where, okay. So now that you've, you've had so much experience, uh, like wrestling guys, you kind of know what their strengths and weaknesses are, right? Mm -hmm. Like a woman's center of gravity is lower than a man's. Absolutely. It's like, I'm sure there are times when you can totally use that to your advantage, like even Absolutely. to win. Absolutely. I found that when like, so in high school, um, I was wrestling around 160, 170. And for a female, that's on the larger side. For a male, that's kind of in the middle. So I would always be shorter. I'm about 5'7". I would always be shorter. Like a male around one, uh, 160, 170 would be like 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 and so I had like a much smaller center of gravity. And I would constantly throw guys. I don't know if you're familiar with judo, but there's a lot of cool throws you can do with just having a lower center of gravity and having wide hips like I do, just kind of throwing, kind of using their own um, height. Weight against, against them. them. Yeah. Yeah. So I would do oh, that frequently. 
Um, and then when I started wrestling females, it was honestly a challenge to get used to somebody being the same height as me, having the same kind of structure with like the waist and the hips and the like women had just have like way bigger thighs. And it's kind of like people don't really think about it, but it really is a different experience to wrestle a woman. So um, I definitely do wrestle women differently. I tend to shoot for the legs more because their legs are bigger and tend to have like more meat and more muscle on them than a male. I can just, I could throw a male pretty easily, but a woman, I find it much more difficult to throw a woman because their hips are at the same level as mine. And then, right. Like harder to like trip, trip or throw. That's so interesting. That's so interesting to me. Um, so how did you get to become, and you're so young like your your shit is so together like you're so mature for uh, like, i can't believe you're 20 years old right like, there you... let me stop you right there my shit is not together whatsoever <laughs> at all i'm really good at lying on twitter i'm not i'm not <laughs> okay, together good. i'm not together at all so let me just correct you but go the, on what, what are the ways in which you're you don't feel like you're together um, the main thing, the main struggle in my life right now is, like I said, coping with not having a wrestling season this past year. It's been very difficult for me. Um, cope, working on getting back in shape for the upcoming wrestling season, because once you skip a season, it gets like already too late. You have to like whip your ass into shape. And I, I struggle with, um, kind of like constantly comparing myself to other wrestlers or even comparing myself to my past self. Like, look how much skinnier you were back then, Olivia. Like now you have to lose weight and like get on the treadmill and blah, 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 blah. And so I do struggle with that. And then the other area I struggle with the most is online school. I really hate it. I had uh, like the best grades of my life the first semester that I was in school. Um, when, when it was actually on campus, I made the dean's list. I was like, wow, I'm like really killing it. As soon as COVID starts, as soon as the online classes start, I am like struggling. And then there's classes that I'm good at, topics that I'm good at. I just think I am the type of learner that prefers like hands on in the classroom. I want to be able to ask questions. I don't like communicating over Zoom or email with my professors all the time because half my professors, they don't even have Zoom classes. They just have like a pre-recorded video that you watch and you email them questions. I just, that those two things, wrestling and school are my main struggles. But, you know, when I log on and do like my live streams and do Twitter and write articles, it feels like it's something that I'm good at. It's something that I could like use as an escape, I guess. So I'm not like feeling like shit about like my grades or like wrestling all the time. <laughs> And that's good. It's like you have like a kind of like spiritual creative release, but it, right. Nothing's going to uh, nothing can kind of replace like that physical release like that after a good yeah. workout feeling of like you're like and um, I have not I have been seriously not prioritizing that over the last year. I just read oh, this thing. Oh, me where, neither. I get so most... much quarantine weight. It's not even funny. It is not that, even funny. I've read the average person gained 29 pounds of quarantine weight. I was like, what? <laughs> I don't know if I gained that much, better. but I wouldn't be surprised if it was like 15, 20 pounds. I would not be surprised if I gained that much. I do have like some dresses that I like just wear on stage and it's like, okay, I fit into one of them and I'm just kind of, I'm a little bit like, I don't want to put the rest on and be like, I can't zip it, you know? <laughs> right. It's a little, it's a little traumatic when I try on like a pair of shorts I wore last year and I'm like, it's a little bit tighter. I'm not, I don't like it. <laughs> Especially when I know at this time last year, I would, I would be looking, I always think I'm like, so fucking fat like where i'm at you know what i mean like i'll always look in the year prior and be like oh i was in such better shape or like that's you know, what it's several years going back ago to, going back to the time where i was like weight cutting like crazy like there was one time i had to cut 23 pounds in like three days it was how? insane. how did you don't do that me. i'm pretty sure the, the stuff i did was probably illegal but i was literally 16 getting ready for junior olympics had to drop 23 pounds and I look back at pictures like that as a 20 year old and I'm like, wow, I thought I was so fucking obese back then. And now I weigh myself by like a good 30, 40 pounds. And I'm like, now I'm like, wow, I really am obese. Now like now I really have to lose like 23 pounds. How, how does someone lose 23 pounds in three days? Like what is one of the things? You have to either use a sweatsuit, which are illegal in a lot of state and states and high schools, or use trash bags, you know, duct tape, trash bags all over your body and run. Thankfully, when I had to do this, it was like the middle of July. So I was running in this parking lot outside of the way in place, running back and forth in this parking lot, doing sprints. Then my dad would turn on the car, turn on the heat and get out of the car and let me sit in the car with the trash bags and just sweat. Also, you spit in a bottle. You can't have any liquid in you so i would spit probably like a wow. pound or two out because if you fill up two eight ounce water bottles that's a pound 
So I kept track of how much water weight <gasps> I was that's losing. that's your water weight. That. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Like, I feel like looking back on it now, like, I'm not trying to say, like, my coaches or, like, my parents were, like, forcing me to do anything I didn't want to do because I definitely wanted to do it. Like, it was my decision. But looking back on it, I feel like certain aspects of wrestling culture and any type of, like, fighting culture, because you have to do the same thing for boxing, MMA, whatever, it definitely – forces on some harmful habits. I definitely kind of developed a really difficult relationship with food. Like I would go days without eating or I would binge eat like crazy and like throw it up. Like it really definitely caused a lot of like disordered eating problems. Um, And that's not even just for female wrestlers. I know multiple male wrestlers who I know from high school, I know from college, who have told me like I feel like I have an eating disorder because of wrestling, but nobody really looks at nobody looks at it as an eating disorder because everyone on the team does it, you know. So, because you don't, the point is you don't want to switch a weight class like in the middle of the season. It's usually it's usually about where the coach needs you because so in high school there's fourteen weight classes in college. I want to say it's only ten at least for the men's. Um. But if somebody, let's say you have somebody already at the 145 pound weight slot, if you are 145 pounds, you can't wrestle. There can only be one person. So you have to drop down to like 136 or some shit. And for some people that's easy, but you can only have one person per weight slot. So if you have two people in the same weight spot, somebody's going to have to either drop down or gain a bunch of weight. So neither choices are that great. You know, like you have to do something kind of drastic. And as, this is especially a problem on really large teams because if there's only 10 spaces and there's 30 people, a lot of people aren't wrestling. A lot of people are killing themselves to get in that spot, you know? So, Wow, you just described, like, people. my actual weight range. It's from, yeah, it's from, like, 135 to 145. So I would be, like, so miserable. But I remember, like, I, uh, I was a diver in college, and uh, it's weird how each sport can kind of cause you to – maybe either have disordered eating or like some sort of body image issue. Cause I remember like, it's just, I cared about the weirdest things. I'd go with like other girl divers. We would like go tanning before meets. Cause we would like obsess about like every part of us. And, and like, you get jealous of some girl. Oh, this girl has like no splash. And I was just, you know what I mean? Like these chicks, like they're like Asian, they're tiny. It's like, you drop a straw in the water. And then like, I would hit the water and I have like an ass and like hips and like boobs. And I'd be like, well, sorry. I just, you oh, know wait, I mean? like, so I'm going to splash. Like splash. They're like, you, they view them as fat or what? <sighs> kind. Well, kind of like I was a big, like I had to really focus to like not to make as little of a splash as I could, but you're, you just are going to have an inherent edge. Like if you're Asian, they, ha- they have like no hips, their bodies are like smaller. They're like smaller shoulders. Everything's like more narrow and it's easy for them to like, just drop into the water and have no splash. But like, it's just when you don't have that body type, like you have to work harder. And I'm, I would always have like some splash. And if I, if I bombed a dive, it would just be huge. And so I don't know, I, I got kind of somewhat obsessed with, like weight and looks and like going tanning and stuff. And then um, and also just like, I think being a woman is like <laughs> having some sort of a being a woman in any sport yeah. in any, anything, anything where you're just going to constantly compare yourself. Cause if you're like, you would be comparing yourself to how another girl looks in a swimsuit. I'm comparing myself to how another girl looks in a singlet all the fucking time. Like, oh it, yeah. I'm like, oh, no everything, you. every part. I'm like, Oh no, it's wild. You. But it's like, ultimately it's good. What do you, and you're God, you're so you're only 20. How do you feel like the last year, the lockdowns and stuff, this the Zoom school is affecting like your generation, like your friends, peers? Like what are what are you it's most worried awful. about? I'm it's fucking awful. Like I said, I feel like it like the Zoom class is saying it's been detrimental to my grades. That makes me anxious. So that makes that makes it detrimental to my mental health. Um, in the beginning of the lockdowns, everyone around here, I'm in Maryland, so everyone around here was like super, super strict, super, super scared. I wasn't hanging out with anybody for like a couple months. So now like now I don't really give a fuck. Like now I I go out, whatever. But there was a time where like I had like no social life whatsoever, just doing the Zoom classes. I mean, it was depressing as fuck. And there's a lot of people who are still in like a much more like, you know, strict lockdowns. And I feel bad for them. And I've, you know, I've talked to my friends. I mean, so before they canceled my season, they my school actually told us that we were going to have a season. So I picked up shit. I moved 
to Pennsylvania. I had an apartment with me and a couple of my other friends on the wrestling team. We were all like working and doing the online classes there and going to practice there for when the season would pick back up and we would all just move on to campus. That never happened, obviously. Um, but just living with my peers and teammates at that time, just the same thing every day, only going to school and only coming back to do, or only going to work and only coming back to do school, not able to compete, not able to, you know, go to the same parties and stuff we did freshman year because I'm a sophomore now. It was just like, it was depressing. We were all living in that house depressed as fuck. Like, it was really bad. That's really horrible. Um, have you, it's so interesting because you're, right, dis- would you describe yourselves like conservative libertarian, conservatarian, which when I was in college, like I was a mega liberal, super like just like all my friends were liberal. It was just like the college culture. So how do you uh, how do you kind of like deal with that? Have you always kind of been more libertarian minded or did you have like a, a changeover at some point? Um, I haven't really been liberal since I've been like 15. I feel like I grew out of that. I was like in that whole like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people my age then went through like a Tumblr activism phase where they're just like it was it's like tumblr was like the old twitter like now now it's like all the sjw's have moved on to twitter but back then that was like the place to be for like all like the social media discourse and all that kind of shit so when i was like like seventh to ninth grade i was like a little tumblr warrior and i remember like arguing about like people's pronouns and fuck shit like that back then and but even then i definitely wasn't the average liberal because i grew up in a household that was like very pro gun like i grew up shooting guns and stuff so even when my other liberal friends were talking about like i would be like okay i'm down with y'all on the social justice stuff but like i actually like guns um and then it really kind of came to a steep drop off when um in 2015 or 2016 um, it was Trump was running for president and all my friends were like, he's a fucking racist. Like, and I was like, yeah, he's a racist. I had, I couldn't tell you why. I literally couldn't tell you Me why. Me too. I was just I like, everyone else not, is, yeah. I couldn't bring up one quote, not one example. Like, I, I for some reason, I, I was convinced he had said the N word, but years later, there is no <laughs> N word tape. So I don't know. And then I went home and I told my dad and I was like, oh my God, Donald Trump's running for president. Like, he's so racist. Then my dad is like, I'm going to vote for Trump. And I'm like, you're black. Like how how you, how you know for Trump? Like he's racist. And so that one question kind of led me to be Googling everything. Like, where is the proof that Trump is racist? And I'm like looking more into it. I'm like, I feel like the Clintons are more racist than Trump. I'm like, this is, Mm -hmm. this is kind of crazy how this election had been marketed to my generation online with really no proof and really no evidence to Trump's alleged racism and all this kind of stuff and he was not the perfect president by far blah 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 but he was he was definitely better than hillary who is one of the worst candidates in history and he's definitely yeah. better than biden and i did vote for trump this past election the first the first time i've ever voted and the thing is i actually do regret it because not the fact that i voted for trump but the fact that i voted in maryland because in the t- at the time i was living in pennsylvania but i was still only registered in maryland so i was like i'll just fill out an absentee ballot but voting for trump in maryland really doesn't make a fucking difference it really mm-hmm. never made a difference it was like 70 percent of marylanders voted for biden so what i should have really done is switched my party re- or my registration to pennsylvania where i was living at the time because that would have made oh. a fuck ton of a difference um so that's my one regret about that because of course he did not win but there there definitely was like a, a period of discovery after i was like wait not every republican's like a fucking racist so for a while i was like okay am i just like the black republican chick like is that is that who i'm gonna be now like i really i was like is this you know, my life like, yeah all right is this my life now like all <laughs> i have to i just have to look at candace owens and be like that's who i'm gonna be now and everyone's gonna hate me and like I'm just gonna say the same talking points as every every other fucking black Republican on Fox News. I really just do, I just didn't want to be that at all. So it took a lot of self reflection. But I was like, okay, what do I actually believe in? I want to talk about like who, which social media influencers I like, or which politicians I like. Like, what do I actually believe? And I do consider myself still on the right. Um, I still hold many of the same opinions. Like I'm very anti 
gun control. I'm very pro free speech. Um, I'm very much a capitalist and things like that. But I look at everything through a pro black lens and I don't think that conservatives do that enough. And I don't think black conservatives do that enough because it's like a thing where, you know how a lot of people say, oh, black people don't have to be a monolith. They don't have to vote Democrat. And I 100% agree with that. But I feel like the same people saying that treat black people on the right as a monolith. Hmm. And I feel like there's not only one type of black conservative. And I think the combination of me speaking to the black community instead of speaking down to the black community, like a lot of people on the right do, combined with me having a lot of libertarian leanings, that really appeals to black people. The fact that I'm one of the only conservatives that will sit up here and say, yeah, I don't I don't like the government. I'm a small government conservative, but the police are not exempt from that. I don't know why every supposed small government conservative is up here with like a thin blue line bumper sticker. Like that shit doesn't make sense to me. If you're going to have a don't tread on me flag, you can't be up here <laughs> worshiping what are essentially agents of the state. And so when I think that intersection really appeals to black people who are otherwise conservative, but don't fit into the status more authoritarian brand of conservatism that is republicanism today which i don't agree with um so that's kind of where i'm at now like we were talking about before before like labels i i i really don't fit into any one category i think you know in terms of trying to describe my political ideology they may even be kind of productive because i fit into like three or four different labels i guess and i'm constantly being told you're not really a conservative. You're not really a libertarian. You're not really pro-black. You oh are a racist. You hate yourself. You're a coon. You're Uncle Tom. Or you, I've been called a black supremacist and a white supremacist. I don't really know how I'm both of those. The, but people don't know what to make of you. Yeah. Do you no, feel literally. like there's a <laughs> lack of um, black conservative sort of role models? Like you said, it, it seems like you're either kind of a Candace Owens or you're uh, like a like a typical like conservative what most people think of it like yeah like you're like a white talking head on fox right um, and I, that's not what i want to be and that's not to say that candace is a fake conservative either because she definitely has her place in the movement i'm just saying we don't all have to be like her and i really am grateful to because the trump administration i think did a good job because trump did prop up candace candace was close with the trumps and all that kind of stuff and then towards the end of the presidency, Trump kind of realized that there are other types of black conservatives. And so when he had the black conservative roundtable with people like Sonny Johnson and Wayne Dupree and Pastor Darrell Scott, who are all more pro-black conservatives and some of who lean more libertarian at the White House. And after that, he miraculously releases the platinum plan for black Americans. I thought that was really great and how and how he didn't limit himself to just, you know, the Fox News talking heads. So that was actually really good. But now I feel like we have to keep that momentum going now that we have a Democrat controlled White House. And it's I think it's time for more conservatives to emphasize on local politics, winning local elections. And that's what I think would benefit the black community the most, because I don't think the federal government is the answer to everyone's problems, especially not the black community's problems. And when you look at the black community in term in you know urban areas, it's mainly controlled by Democrats. So I don't think that having a Republican president is going to change Baltimore or Chicago or Detroit mm -hmm. or Southeast D.C., I think it's mainly local politics. So I think now is the time to take the momentum of putting black conservatives on the stage and be like, okay, here's the plan. Like, here's the plan for our communities. We don't have to rely on anybody else. We don't want to have like a politicians kneeling in fucking Kent State cloth. Like this is not helping us. Like Nancy Pelosi is not helping us. The Democrats aren't helping us. The Republicans aren't helping us. Nobody's helping us. Um, so I think now it's time for it to take some action, but um, yeah, like, like I said, I don't want it to come across as like me, like hating on Candace or hating on anybody else. No, not at all. That's yeah. Not the case. It, it's just always tricky when you're kind of like the first of something. Like I, I can't think of any other kind of like pioneering, like black conservative voices. Like, yeah, for me, like I, I discovered Candace Owens. I was like, oh my God, like, you know, not black. Was I was black like, I looked up to her so much. Right. There definitely was black Republicans before that, but nobody popularized the movement like she did. Because when I think of like the OG black Republicans, you think of like Ben Carson or like an OG right. black conservative, you think of like Condoleezza Rice. But did they popularize oh. 
did they popularize the movement for black people no not really they didn't they weren't like a big talking head or commentator or anything um so they definitely existed but it wasn't such a popular thing until candace Basically, until Candace got that shout out from Kanye was when I really got big. But I had followed her for years. And I really, when I first discovered that I was kind of like the black Republican girl, I was like following her on YouTube back when she was called Red Pill Black and she didn't even go by her real name. Like, I, mm. I, was, oh, like wow. OG. I was like OG Candace Owens fan. And then I, I met her in 2018 and everything was cool, whatever. And then it, w- it was weird because after I was exposed to like the popular black conservatism i was just really disenchanted with it i was like i feel like the same way that black democrats are owned by white liberals i feel like black republicans are owned by white conservatives i feel like wow. nobody is really nobody is really honest here and nobody really actually cares about the community um and when candace said stuff like she learned black history from charlie kirk who is the guy from turning point usa i was like I feel like we need somebody who learned black history from black people, you know, not Charlie Kirk, not a, not a 25 year old college dude. Like it's just, Hmm. that's when I kind of became a little disenchanted by it. So I was like, I need to find my own people. And this is not to say like, I'm like now I'm following. I'm not, not that I'm following or being a fan of anyone else now. It's just that I want to align myself with people who have something positive to say about the black community, not all just, talking about Cardi B and how she ruined the black community and stuff like that. Cause I really don't think that Cardi B is a representative of the black American community. I just, I don't. So she's just um, such an easy target. To... It's like, a la- it's, it's lazy to pick on her. She's so obviously a definitely bad example. Low hang- definitely yeah. low hanging fruit. And she's not American. Her parents are immigrants. Neither her parents are, are both her parents are Caribbean or Latino, and I'm not saying they don't have black in them, but neither of her parents are black. So I'm like, yeah, I thought, I thought she was Dominican. Yeah, she's Dominican. So I'm like, why is she the representation of the Black American community when both her parents are Latino? And she like, it was just, it's just very weird for me. So it's definitely low hanging fruit to be like, Cardi B is ruining the lives of the Black community. I'm like, sh- she really isn't that big of a part of it. So I don't yeah, see I the need to call her out all the time. I imagine, like, just if you're a parent who's concerned, like, just, like, don't have your kids, like, listen to her music. Like, like there's so many other options. Right, like, um, you can, you're allowed to parent your kids. I mean, don't let the media parent your kids. The media has always been bad. Hollywood has always been bad. So, yeah. What are the ways in which, because you mentioned before, like, the just not enough pro-Black and you want to bring more positivity, like, into the community and into maybe politics or awareness? Like, what are what are the areas that are, like, think, like, glaringly lacking to you? So, Republican outreach in the Black community has historically always been pretty bad. But lately, I feel like once Trump lost the election and proved that the whole Blexit, Black exodus movement from the Democrat Party really didn't take place yet i feel like republicans once again just drop black people are like we're done playing with y'all because if you go on twitter Ugh. it's like countless conservatives going like oh this mass shooting happened but what about chicago what about chicago what about all the black on black crime i'm like okay do something about it then because you clearly don't care you're only using it for talking points you clearly don't care or the people mm, who wow. my favorite talking point is Look at 13% of the population, just 50% of the crime. That's my favorite talking point because it's so easily debunked. When you look at who is committing the most amount of crime, it's black men in between the ages of 16 and 25. That's not 13% of the population. That's like 1% of the population. And then when you go into that, it's less than 1% of that population that's actually committing the majority of crime. So it's really, really a small, a minuscule faction of the black community that is being raised in a an awful, horrible, drug-ridden, over-policed um, criminal environment that is committing the majority of violent crimes. I'm not saying that's not a problem. I'm just saying it's not representative of the entire Black community. But if you would look at Fox News or look at the majority of conservative pundits, white or Black, because the, all the mainstream ones generally have a negative view on Black people, you would really believe that it's the majority of Black people. You would really believe that 13% of the American population is committing 50% of the crimes when in reality... It's a very, very tiny percentage of the black community, a very, very tiny percentage of the American mass amount of crime. Let's definitely attack that reason. But the reason isn't like black people have like a predisposition to commit 
like to steal or to like sexually assault people. Like that's really not the answer. Um, and I think that you can address problems in the black community from a conservative lens, but by also coming up with solutions. So I don't want to be like, oh, black fathers are just deadbeats and black dads need to go back into the home and fix their community because I understand that there are strong disparities and strong, I should say, differences in the way that black people and white people are treated in the, in the justice system. I mean, even if you look at something very simple as marijuana sentencing, the disparities are huge between arrest rates and sentencing between the races. So when you think about something like the war on drugs, when you think about something like the Second Amendment, where in reality, most black cities, most urban cities have the strictest gun control laws so when you're like okay so we're on drugs non-violent drug offenses non-violent firearms offenses shouldn't conservatives be looking at that and be like all these black men are being put in jail over this bullshit shouldn't we be looking to to solve that and maybe that will help put black fathers back in the home instead of wagging your finger and saying all this racist shit i think there's actual solutions that could be held which is why i say things like i think that this kind of conservatarian or conservative libertarian intersection is very appealing to black people because I think black people see the issues with over-policing. I think black people see the issues with the war on drugs. And I also think a lot of black people are beginning to see the issues with mass immigration, which the Republicans, mm. they should be jumping all over that. They should be like, mass immigration is not good for the black community. But no, but no, instead they're saying black men need to fix their saggy pants and fix their deadbeat attitudes and go home and take care of your kids. I'm like, there's reasons for this shit there's reasons for this shit. So I abhor the progressive policies that have ruined the black community, like gun control. I abhor the big government policies that have ruined the black community, like welfare, like Planned Parenthood, like abortion. So that's where I'm conservative. But the pro-black part is something that a lot of conservatives don't see. They don't see solutions. They just want to talk negatively and down to us. And I don't think that that's very effective. So and that's where people call me like a, a bigot or a racist or like a fake conservative. And they're like, you're just, you sound like a liberal. You sound like a Black Lives Matter liberal protester. I'm like, no, I'm not out here rioting or screaming Black Lives Matter. I'm just saying there is a way to reverse these progressive policies that have ruined the Black community. And the way that I'm doing it is a lot different from the way you're doing it because I'm actually speaking on what is wrong. And I'm actually volunteering and doing activism in the community. And you were sitting on Twitter talking about, but what about Chicago? But what about Chicago? Like, that's how I know it's very fake. And I don't feel like a lot of conservatives are genuine in their concern for the black community. Like I said, after Blexit didn't work, they were like, all right, bye. We don't care. I think it's a good sign that people struggle to put you in a box because that means that you're not taking all your views from somebody else. And that means that you're not like you're a free thinker and it's, you know, different issues are like hitting you. So, I mean, I struggle with that too. Like not knowing what box to put myself and then other people being like, Oh, you're this, you're that. So it's like, it shows that you're, right. I'm like, I'm not a fake anything. I mean, people are like, stop calling yourself a conservative. Stop calling yourself a libertarian. I'm about five seconds away from being like, <laughs> I will not claim any party any ideology whatever y'all can follow me if you want to y'all can unfollow me if you want to i'm about five seconds from just being like fuck it but as of now i do i do keep telling people i'm like a conservatarian just because those are the people i align with the most those are the people i end up working with the most you know i've worked on multiple republican campaigns i'm not even a registered republican wow. so i feel like it's like that's what i have to tell people like i'm a conservative libertarian independent because then I get to work with anybody because I get to have so I get to have so many cool conversations with people I bring onto my channel on my show I talk to libertarians independents conservatives republicans and then I you know I go out and I try to I guess like work with all everyone who kind of falls under that umbrella which is like I guess that's the only really useful term for like having a label is because you can identify other people but right now like the next comment i get that's like you're a fake libertarian i'll be like fine <laughs> fine i'm a fake libertarian fine now what what now what are you gonna do what right now? i think other people's desire to define everyone around them takes them like off the hook from having to do anything like of value like i, I just right. think 
the folks that get obsessed with like putting people into boxes it's like okay yeah exactly then what let's say uh let's say we're both fake libertarians okay that that doesn't mean we're gonna stop doing right. stuff and it's, yeah it's, the, the only time i would call somebody a fake libertarian is the liberty hangout people because they use the name liberty way too loosely i mean if you oh, look really? at <laughs> if you look, if you just scroll through their page, they're basically like theocrats. They're always talking about like, they're always talking about like the gay agenda and like the interracial agenda and how Trump should be a monarch and shit. I'm like, you guys are like authoritarian as fuck. Like, this is not, this is, oh, wow. this is not libertarian. I don't know why Liberty Hangout has Liberty in the name. Um, I mean, check more, them out. All I know from too, all I know from all I know from them is um Caitlin, what's her face? Caitlin Bennett. Yeah, she's not a fucking yeah. libertarian either. And like <laughs> I'm not she, she's like she's always she's always tweeting about women need to get back into the kitchen and shit. I'm like, okay, you have the freedom to do that, I guess. She but... can get back there. Yeah. Like anybody who wants to can get back there. It's right. just frustrating if you want to get back in the kitchen. Well, it's like then you gotta find a rich dude, which and then you're like, uh, you know. Or I know that's like sometimes I I do have like a little fantasy of being like a little housewife and whatever, and then I'm like I don't know any rich dudes, so let me just I know. Uh, let me like try to get a job first and just see if I can land a rich dude, and then I just won't have to work anymore. <laughs> it's such an odd. I feel like the culture is so like at at odds with um this. There's this weird uh, meeting of like conservative and and like non conservative yeah. values, right? Like there's women who genuinely like they want to be moms they want to raise a family but in order to have that you have to have like a rich guy i mean like there's just no way i mean maybe back in the day a regular ass guy with a regular ass job could make that happen um but then but then there's also the negative side of it where like you have women that like maybe they just want to be um like gold diggers or they just don't want to work or they want to be like they watch right. housewives they watch that's kardashians how a lot of people come across. that's a lot of these these supposed trad wives come across they're like i don't want to do anything i want to be in the kitchen and pop out babies and my husband will just work and do everything i'm like uh i don't i really don't want to do that either i feel like i'll be somewhere in between where I do think I, I'd make a good mother someday, but I also want to have a career. But of course, if I become a mother, I would prioritize family and children first. I feel like that's natural. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I'm somewhere in between like the traditional and progressive standpoint on gender roles. But, yeah. you know, anytime I say anything about gender roles, people are like, well, you wrestle. And that's very masculine. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. So I, so I really can't claim to be traditional at all because I'm yeah. a combat or I very vocal, like I'm very like career and like politically driven, which is not like trad at all. So that's another, that's another thing where I really don't even care to label myself with because it's like, I just live my life. I really do. Like it's, and that's the thing is know. like, I've met, I've had friends, parents where like the mom is like, she's the fucking, she's the bitch in charge. Like she tells her, she's literally like, you know, I'll, I had friends growing up, like their moms would literally like throw them off the couch or like get, whip everybody into shape. They'd be the ones to like call and complain and make things happen. And the guy would be kind of the more just like sweeter, more nurturing, more like passive parent. So there's always going to be, you know, a, like a different parent dynamic like that. And that, that doesn't make it any less like traditional or like right. natural or whatever. Like some guys are just going to be like, like it would, you would, it would take a, like a more maybe chill dude to like balance you out, you know, just like I need a guy who's going to kick my ass a little bit. Cause I can mm -hmm. be too like ambivalent. So, um, I just think it's great that you at 20 are like, like pretty well spoken. I know you're like, don't think you have all your shit together, but you're like, cause I uh, don't, because <laughs> you don't but like you're you're heading in the, i mean i just feel like you're it sounds like your dad must be so proud of you because he kind of started you on this path to you know open your mind and and think about all this stuff yeah my entire family like even though we all i really have very different views than my entire family at this point because my dad is more of like my dad's more of just like an old school republican type like he, I think he's a registered independent and he's gone through like a grand political journey throughout the last decade because both my parents voted for Obama. So it's not like I grew up in like a strict looking household. Now he's definitely more so that way. Um, and my mom's more of like the liberal of the family, but still not, she's not like a leftist, more just like a, I feel like she could be described as a classical liberal of some sorts. Um, but everyone kind of supports me. I mean, they're just like, okay, we agree with Olivia, but she's out here doing her thing. So that's uh that's whatever and i feel like this past year it's been really great for me because i've been like getting some more like 
you know, like public speaking opportunities here and there. And I've gotten to work with like really cool people. Um, and just to, just to tease a couple of things, but I'm, I'm, tr I'm about to be in the process of probably working with Kimberly Clayson because she asked me to, Whoa! well, That's she asked exciting. me to come on this HBCU speaking tour with her. And I was like, just give me the dates. I'll definitely do that with you because she's one of the, she, I think she's one of the few mainstream black conservatives who's actually pro black and actually has like some really cool, unique ideas. And then I can't say the name or like, or anything really about this show yet, but uh, there is a HB HBO show coming out in, I think, May 25th or some shit that I'm featured in talking about the wow. same shit. Wow. So there's a couple things in the works that I've been, not to brag, but I've been proud of myself this year because, like I said, I've had, like, a really bad time. You with brag. With, well, I just had yeah. a bad time with the coping of, like, COVID and quarantine and all that shit. So, it like, I don't know. It, it feels good to, like to have people listen to me and, and want to work with me even though i'm like literally mentally unstable so <laughs> <laughs> that's so great i love that you can like point that out nobody's perfect everyone's got we all have bad <laughs> days we all are like messy like i'm very messy in many areas too uh your twitter is so funny i like i've been like loving your tweets like uh, one of them was like, I can't believe people are now putting like vaccinated in their profile pics. Oh my and, uh, God. It's so annoying. Ugh, that's so I, gross I, to me. I, I really don't even be using the dating apps and stuff, but I've seen so many screenshots. I'm I'm like, this is like the most embarrassing thing about me. I'm on like Reddit, like all the time. And that's where I <laughs> no, find, good. That's where I find my best memes. And I've seen like so many screenshots of just random. It's mostly girls doing this. It's mostly girls being like vaccinated. Don't swipe if you're not vaccinated. Don't swipe if you're if you voted for Trump. Don't like it's like all this like weird political shit. I'm like I thought Tinder was for like hooking up. Like why are you? Why do y'all give a fuck? Why do y'all give a fuck? It's grandstanding. It's virtue signaling, and it's like you know any one of those girls if like a hot guy walked into a bar and they were there and they, they were would like, not huh? give a they would give if a he had fuck. a MAGA hat on, if he had a fucking Nazi armband on, most <laughs> most chicks are literally shallow as fuck. Like the amount of girls I know who are like a self-proclaimed like social justice warrior that have racist ass fucking boyfriends. <laughs> I'm like, that was literally the highest. That was literally the highest I grew I grew up in. Like I I went to like the two high schools I went to were both majority white. And all the girls would like grandstand about how they were so like it's like Black Lives Matter and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, their boyfriend over there with the fucking mullet is like yelling at yelling the N word at somebody. So I'm like, I know that you guys really don't give a fuck. I know that you guys really don't. And, and again, like anybody so obsessed with with like, yeah, uh preaching their label, it's like you know that like they'll probably be easily they could be easily swayed, you know, like, yeah, a hot guy with like a great job. And you're like, Oh, I guess I'll rethink this. You I know, can, I can fix him. I can fix him. Um, and we're all, I don't know. I can't speak for you, but I feel like every female is guilty at one point for trying to like fix like the shittiest guy on the face. Of, the planet. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh my God. It's like my third job. Oh, for sure. Like forever. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I know. Before. I feel like I deserve some benefits or like fucking like dental or like some insurance or something. Oh yeah. It's, you know what it is? Cause, like, women are like we're very like forgiving and empathetic and and like understanding sometimes to a fault and like sometimes like easygoing and people pleasing to a fault and you're like go mm -hmm. with the flow you're like oh i can like i'm i'm good enough to make this guy change oh. and it's like <laughs> you take it personally it's like no it's like just accept that he will like the day i accepted that my boyfriend will never pick up his socks is the day i was like all right that's a weight off okay it's not a reflection right. take it, it personally a huge relief you you can't yeah. you can't change it you can't change okay, it but like, yeah i definitely spent a lot of time trying to convince guys to just not treat me like shit when I, and and then now, now i'm like why did i do that like not that i'm a hot commodity but i'm like i can definitely worth more than that you know everything you, is. it's like the frog in water like we've all been in bad relationships like they're not shitty out the gate or else you'd you know, like wouldn't be with them. It's like a little bit over time. And then like, uh, and then there's good parts to them. So and then like, you know, that's what I would do when I'd have I like say this though. I agree with that for the most part of my relationship ever when I was 16, I think it was literally never good. Literally there was <laughs> not one redeeming quality. I just had oh, like no. the worst self-esteem, the worst self-worth ever. Like I grew up very much like the ugly duckling. Like I feel like I was a cute kid. Then when I hit, I hit middle school, I was like, like, 
puberty hit me like a fucking truck, not in a good way. <laughs> like it was fucking wild. Oh. I came out like halfway decent, but like literally from the ages of like 13 to 16, I was fucking ugly. So when I first got my boyfriend, I was like, oh my God, like somebody likes me. Like this is great. But he he really just wanted like like any like 90% of high school guys, they really just want sex. They really don't give a fuck about your feelings. So of course I had to learn that the hard way. And now I'm looking back on like, there was literally no redeeming qualities at all. I just had no confidence. And then once yeah. I started winning the wrestling tournaments, I was like, fuck yeah, I don't need these dudes anymore. So, yeah. I was the exact I same. Wrestling. I was the exact same way. I was 22, my first boyfriend. And I thought having a boyfriend just mean, just meant that like you put up with someone's bullshit and stay with them no matter what. Like I yep. caught this guy cheating on me and I just was like, all right, I guess we have to work through this meeting. I have to work through it. I was like, I love this man cheating me like three times. I was like, okay, I guess this is what we're doing. And I remember he like took me out uh, to tell me this on the beach. Like he took me to Long Beach in Long Island. And I was like, oh, this is romantic. And he took me out there to tell me that he had been cheating on me with his Russian tutor and that he had chlamydia. And I was like, all right, I guess, (laughs) I guess we got to go to the pharmacy this is what we're doing with our weekend now it like never occurred oh, to me to leave my. i just was like all right was he under the impression that, that was like a really noble thing to do like take you to the beach and break the news to you oh my god i've been like yeah i could have saved a trip because it just like told me in your stank apartment and i would have been like oh. <laughs> but it's that in- is insane yeah it was it was very sad and then like he cheated on me again <laughs> same guy i would find like long black and i had short very short blonde hair at this time i would find like long black hairs in his bed and he would be like oh it's the cleaning lady it's esmeralda and then esmeralda and then i would like be like okay like as i was still just like an idiot like first boyfriend no self-esteem kind of place and then he ended up telling me like oh I cheated on you with this girl from college and she's pregnant. And I was like, okay. <gasps> so and it took it took like that Tell me much. you left me at this point. And then I walked please. away. Then I was like, okay, okay. This is, now there's another person that's gonna be in this really, you know what I mean? Like there's a baby for me that was like, all right, I guess we are then I will see myself out. <laughs> Thank took, you. That's it, really I was really scared for you at this point because I thought you were gonna be like, Yep, but I I helped deliver the baby. I was right yep, there every step and of the way. Still with him now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. And then you just, it just takes the years of like, oh, I feel so bad when I'm with this person. Oh, you can just not be with them. So, yeah. It's like we all go through it. Uh, I don't know why, I don't know why people like put up with people cheating on them. I did that shit so many times. I put up with this dude cheating on me with literally my best friend. And I was like, I was like more mad at her than I was at him. I was like, wait, this is fucked up. I mean, I was obviously I should have been mad at both of them, but I should have been way more mad at him at the time. Yeah, like it's possible to work past it, but it, it's like breaking, um, like a, it's like a crack in a glass. Like it'll never not be there. It'll never, you know, like it was like, you know, if it's it, like but... one time you got drunk and like did something you regret and told me, I could like, I, I could probably be like, I'm not saying I'll forgive you, but I'd be like, I'd be open to have a conversation. But I like literally my best friend, it was been going on for a while. So I was like, uh, okay, that really sucks. Yeah, that really, I really don't know why I didn't just like slap the shit out of him, but I didn't. And I regret it every day. <laughs> it's all right. We live, we learn. I'm so excited to see this HBO thing coming out with you in it. Me too. Um, oh my God. It's going to be. I feel like I said some crazy shit in it, so hopefully it doesn't like the way they edit it make me look too crazy. But because <laughs> it, it, it's just it, it's just a whole thing. But I think I think it went well. Um, Olivia, where can people find you, follow you, support you, etc.? Um, I'm mainly on Twitter, so just search my name. That's O L I V I A R O N D E A U, and the same thing on YouTube. I just started doing my live streams. I'll post like news and commentary videos every once in a while as well. Um, and that that's basically it. All all my links and stuff you could definitely find on Twitter or YouTube. I love your stuff. Yeah, I was just like looking at your channel earlier. I really love you put out this recent video. I forget the name of the guy you were doing it with, but you go all into detail about like why the black community is like hesitant about the jab. And I was like all your reasons were like very legit and i was like oh thank you and so insightful so i'm so excited to follow you olivia and see uh see what the future holds i, I feel like i sound like your aunt i'm just like you're such a do. wonderful <laughs> you definitely do a little bit but like a cool aunt vibes. Aunt, i guess 
cool aunt, aunt vibes. I'm like, you're such a wonderful young woman. All right. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Olivia. This was so Thank great. You. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.